tuned in to The Andrew Lawton Show. Well, we often talk about rights and freedoms, and we think of these in the context of freedom of speech, of democratic rights, equality rights. What about economic rights? Are these things that you've even considered? Today on The Andrew Lawton Show, we're doing a deep dive into those because a new initiative has been formed by the legendary titan of industry, Frank Stronick, called the Stronick Foundation for Economic Rights. Frank, it's wonderful to talk to you. Thanks for sitting down with me. Good. It's nice to be with you, Andrew. Yeah. So why do, we'll talk about what those economic rights should be in, in a couple of moments, but first and foremost, why does there need to be, in your view, an, an economic charter of rights embedded in the Canadian Constitution? Well, let me try to simplify things. I think most people agree, politicians, businessmen, people, women and men, and many other people agree, if the economy doesn't work, nothing else will work. If the economy doesn't work, we cannot feed the hungry, we cannot look after the most fragile people, the elderly, the sick and the handicapped. But, but we do not talk what drives the economy. It's funny, it's, it's uh, strange. So the economy is driven by three forces, smart managers, hardworking employees, and investors. So all three have a basic right to the outcome, which is profits. The message I want to get across is workers have a moral right to some of the profits to help to generate. Without them, we could not generate a profit, right? So it's, to me, it's amazing that we don't do it more, right? So let's talk about that because your company, Magna, did this and you know gave employees a share of the profits and found that it increased productivity quite significantly. So there was a, an economic benefit to it. It wasn't just a, a charitable endeavor. You've called for there to be a, a legal right for employees of large companies to have a share of profits. And I, I know a lot of free market conservative types would be a little bit nervous about that because it sounds like you're telling you're asking government to tell businesses how to structure their finances. So why is that appropriate in your view? Well, we, there's a lot of things where government tells uh, citizens or people speed limits on cars, right? On, mm -hmm. on, on roads, right? So there's many, many rules and regulations that we have. It is the economy because it's a fundamental, right? The, uh, the economy is driven by three forces. So I... Uh, what I'd like to do is, I'd like to, uh, the small companies have always been the backbone of a country, right? Mm -hmm. When you take a closer look, uh, all the new inventions, the new uh, gadgets, the new patents, etc., etc., is done pretty well, most of by small companies. Right? And small companies, the tax revenue uh, the government gets uh, is, I think it's the, the highest contributor to the, to, to the taxes, right? Mm -hmm. For the simple reason there's so many small businesses and uh, the business don't make a lot of monies, but they have employees and employees pay a wage tax, right? So, um, so uh, I'm saying small business is, uh, um, the way small business actually works is, uh, you know, a man or a woman saved up some monies and said, look, I'm going to try this and that and take a risk. And uh, some succeed and some don't. That's, uh, that's the way it is. But uh, when they start out in business, they don't make any monies because they buy a new piece of equipment or they hire somebody. Their main thing is to do, they, they realize if they have more employees, the chances are they make more money, right? So, so I'm saying we should, small business should not pay business tax because the forms they have to fill out, to whom they can write for lunch at dinner, could they write it off, or is it a business? They, they, we, should, we should scrap that, right? In essence, I could see maybe a thousand magnets. I, it would be tremendous if we have small business and uh, take the red tape off, huh? mm -hmm. totally. 
uh, because there is so many government regulations. The only two rules will apply, huh? Workplace safety, because you don't want to see that somebody loses a hand or whatever, right? So it's important. And the environment, you could not dump poison in your backyard, right? So those are the only two rules and everything else you pretty well got to take off. In essence, I'm saying, look, Canada functioned fine 40, 50 years ago. We should maybe go back with the thing here. And, and yes, we built buildings. They, they you know, you, you still, when you, when you build a building, it's, you can still need the engineer stamp that they carry, that carry the snow load, etc. Et that to get the bureaucracy out, okay? It's, uh, as an example, I'm waiting for close to three years now to get a farmer's market, to permit they can build the farmer's market. It's in three, what, what do you, like, what's the holdup? What, what is it that you need the permission to do? The holdup was, uh, you know, first I, I had uh, 5,000 square feet and the bylaw said the maximum we could have 3,000 square feet for our farmer's markets, right? After half a year, I, I kind of did told me. So there were always, you know, it, it, it's just incredible, right? And, and you have, I mean, in your position, you have the money, you have the staff, you can navigate these things. If you're someone that wanted to build that farmer's market as your only source of income, it wouldn't work. You you wouldn't be able to do it. I could never build the magna anymore, right? I mean, uh, you know, uh, 30 years ago, uh, within two weeks, I had a permit, right? If I want to, you know. It, there was things were uncomplicated, right? So now it's it's you know uh, I'm building a new factory now. It's just about finished. Where I built the small electric cars. The factory was uh, was maybe half finished. I had to build in the thing here from the township. I got a I got a pay a million nine hundred thousand to them. So I inquired, what's that for? Well, that is that we allow you to build the factory. Wow, <laughs> it's yeah, it, 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 it's uh, it, it's incredible, right? Mm -hmm. So I remember about fifty years ago when the first computers came on the market. The slogan was, "If you got one of those computers, you could eliminate a total office floor." Now, when I look around in the cities, might it be Toronto, Montreal, Ottawa, or uh, Vancouver, or, or, or in the states or in Europe? I see 20 times more office buildings, high rises, high rises. What do you think they do in there? They don't make products in there. It's regulations and financial transactions. So we have a dilemma. And that all started about, again, about 50 years ago when Wall Street was pushing uh, business, you're going to make more monies. Mm -hmm. And the unions, on the other hand, pushed and said, look, you got to, we need higher wages. So business did the easy way out, they went to China. So we don't really make things, huh? When you, when you see a building go I'm up, now it's a warehouse. Yes. It's not a factory where we make things. Mm. And if you don't make things, you, the living standards will, will get down. By warehousing, it's not, right? That means you buy somebody else's goods. So to go back to the problems you're trying to solve here with this economic charter, do you believe that the capitalist free market project has failed people? Or do you believe that it just needs to be tweaked? No, the, we, we got we to gotta make sure, right? So, so I'm, I'm starting out to say uh, I divide the businesses. Uh, below 300 employees, I will classify from a small business, right? And we should give them, a, um, we get all the, the red tape off. Let them, let them be. It's pure free enterprise, pure, right? And that's what you said. Just leave environmental restrictions and pollution okay, yeah, and safety. Just that's do, it. but yes. but pure free enterprise, pure capitalistic, pure. Let let them hustle, right? Let the let the let the let them make fifty million, or hundred, or five hundred million, right? It's only when it get larger, right? Uh, then companies are run by institutions, etc. And to them, sometimes. They have no affinity for employees, right? Uh, so I think it's important that uh, large companies, uh, I think the law will provide that they get, the employees will get a, a portion of the profits. But I'm coming back to, uh, you know, when I talk to business people and say to Frank, 
sounds okay, but I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. I want to, I don't want if government telling me yeah. what, etc. It's et fair enough. So basically, I'm saying, you start out with small companies, huh? And I want to tell people, you got to get away from a boss attitude, right? Boss and workers, right? Years ago, you had masters and servants, mm -hmm. and now we have bosses and workers, right? Some bosses are okay, right? But most of the thing are not, baby, you know, workers get disgruntled, union sat down and sat. So we need a culture change, huh? Let me give you an example. Um, I should, maybe, maybe I go all the way back. When I, uh, when I started out in business, I, I'm a tool and die maker by trade. I had about $5,000 saved up in 57. 5000 now. I guess you could buy a small farm. You know, it was that much, right? But anyway, I started out, rented uh, the gatehouse of standard, uh, American standards uh, product. Uh, the gatehouse was a small, like a large garage, right? And I bought a few used machines on a down payment. And out I went hustling. I went to the factories and I said, I'm very good in solving problems. If I can't, if I can't solve the problems, then you don't have to pay me. But anyway, one after one month, I hired somebody. After a year, I had about 10 people. And after two years, I had about 20 people. After five years, I had about 5,000 people. After 10 years, I had about 50,000, right? After 15 years, 100,000. But let me go back when I had, after two years, I had 20 people. I noticed my foreman was a little different. So uh, his name was Herman. So, Herman, what's the matter with you lately? Well, he said, he said, Frank, I, I'm thinking of uh, pretty well, I will start my own business. And I said, well, I can sympathize. He was my first employee. He was the foreman, right? Okay. So I said, let's talk tomorrow. Maybe we can find a better way. Anyway, that evening I was talking to myself and I asked myself, if that foreman's going to leave me, that would stifle my growth. They didn't like that. The next thing was, if that foreman's got to leave me, I got to do all the work myself. I liked it even less. And the third reason was, if I hire a new foreman and I don't show him a bit how a business is run, I still got to do all the work. And if I show a foreman how a business should be run, after a year, two years, he will leave, right? Mm -hmm. So anyway, the next day I said to my foreman, I said, look, why don't we open up a new factory on one third? I own two thirds. By the end of the year, we take pro rata, we take some monies out. And he said, you mean it? Yeah. I said, yeah. So he went to a lawyer right away, wrote it down. The guy was, that was his business, right? He was hustling no more over time, uh, you know. And he was proud. And uh, I took the next foreman, the next foreman, the next. All of a sudden, oh. I was still a pretty young guy. I had, uh, you know, things were flowing like... Uh, Okay, and then I became philosophical, and I said, gee, um, now only the, only the foreman, only the manager, uh, you know, uh, uh, participating in the profits in ownership, actually, you know. So I said, I got to find a way where employees also could participate, and then I figured, well, maybe it should be a public company, right? So which I... I I got introduced to the to the the fellow which created Magna Electronics, right? It's a small they were in the defense industry, electronic thing yeah. So I got introduced and uh, the fellow which run uh, or started that, he said, Look, I have a certain age, I would like to rent out. Why don't you sell your companies and mine? You take over and uh, which I did, huh? I was totally green when he come down to public companies, but I knew that it's easier for employees to participate, right? Mm -hmm. Because sometimes when you be a small company and the worker wants to sell, right, it's difficult, right? But if it's public, you know, you get the shares, whatever the thing is. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that's what I did, right? And um, I... Yeah, like I said, I was very green. I was still very young, very green when it came down to the market. Later years after, I've been on the corporate governance board of the stock exchange in New York, right? And I've been on, yeah, mm -hmm. many, 
on many boards on universities, hospitals, banks, and et cetera, et cetera. So anyway, I came, I came to, the, to the conclusion that I want to also have the employees involved, which I did, right? I think I put in, in the mid-80s or oh, late-80s, I put in a corporate constitution. And the foremost principle in our corporate constitution is we predetermine what we do with the profits. So 20% of the profits went to the shareholders, 10% of the profits went to the workers uh, over and above their wages. 3% went to management. 7% went to research. Research is the foundation for the future. And 2% uh, went to charity. The point I want to make, the first year our profits were up about 40%. The second day were up about 100%. The third year, they were up about 200%. Because employees I, were motivated. I, I, you, to... you, more than motivated, in tangible terms. You know, uh, they're not employees and what they're partners. Huh? I want to get away from a boss relationship to workers. Huh? So, uh, so uh, you release an enormous energy, right? Okay. Because they're on the front line, they can, we can make this better, that better, et cetera, et but, cetera. But to, to push back on that for a moment, if it makes sense from a business perspective, why do you need to legislate it? If, 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 the, market, if the market reason is there, why do you need to put it in a charter, in a constitution? It is, uh, I'm, um, I'm saying it is a culture change. Huh? So I'm not... Uh, early on, I kind of thought, hey, you know, sometimes when you try to create a charter, you try to look at every angle, mm -hmm. everything here, right? Upside down, sideways. You want to get, uh, you want to listen to a lot. And, and it came up actually quite, you know, we, uh, a bunch of business people I respect to say, Frank, I don't want to have government telling me what yes. to do. Okay? Okay? So, um, so I'm saying I'm uh, I'm leaving it now. You still have small companies below 300 people. They have they pay no business tax because they make so little. So let them focus on the thing here and let them focus to build a company. When they go over the 300, then they got to make their mind up. Do I? then I got to pay a percentage of the profits to the workers. So basically, you create a culture, right? And you leave, uh, you know, I know larger accounts, they have shareholders, and shareholders sometimes, a day is a lifetime. They say, I want to sell my share. It, 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 it would create, it would be a bit of a hassle, but, so it's not. So in essence, I'm saying, look, let's, a great day, you know. If you don't want to, if you don't want to, then you you don't grow, or you, or maybe you start another company, yeah. right? With uh, but you cannot have control, right? Of okay. two, right? But so when you get sort of thing here, you you must be you did not have to pay. We made it easy for you. No, if you grow be large, you make your mind up, but you really create a culture. Uh, 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 I think uh, mm -hmm. business would a uh, woman would say. I make more monies that way if I share, <laughs> right? So it's a culture change to get away from a boss thing to, you know, to, to a partnership. You mentioned earlier the fact that no one is making anything in, in North America now. And I wanted to ask you about free trade on this because I, I think that, you know, for a lot of people, free trade was viewed as being the the great antidote to all of these economic challenges 30 years ago. And obviously you being in the automotive sector, you've benefited from this. Do you still think that is the road to prosperity? No, I would say fair trade, huh? Okay, trade should relate to to, to, to jobs, huh? Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, some countries, um, their regulations might not be as quite as tight as they should be to protect employees, etc. Et it should relate to jobs, okay? And uh, but um, free trading, it would be okay, right? It's, uh, um, 
but it 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 when when you get different cultures uh, you uh, you might uh, the competitors the, the the playing field might not be fair at level huh so to go back to the problems we have right now you mentioned something very important earlier frank which was that you couldn't create another magna today do you believe that the innovative spirit still exists in Canada? Do you think it's still there and could be captured if you were to get the regulations and the red tape and the bureaucracy out of the way? Yeah, I, I think it would be there, huh? yeah, but we have to... You know, sometimes people go... It, it's an evolutionary process, an ongoing, right? Where people became, get more complacent, where there's not that drive anymore, right, by young people, et cetera, et cetera. And I see, I, I give a lot of lectures, right, from Harvard right across the States, right across Canada, right across Europe, right? And um, I always told the students, the success of life can only be measured the degree of happiness you reach. But at the same time, I told them, let me tell you from my experience, it's a lot easier to be happy if you got some monies. So the smart students would have said, look, uh, what do you recommend that we, you know, that we, what should we do? Well, I usually said, uh, look, when you be uh, around 20 or in your early 20s, you don't know yourself. Experiment a bit. Do something what you really enjoy. If you enjoy something, you're going to be good in it. And if you put in the extra effort, you could be one of the best. If you be one of the best, money is a byproduct. But the very interesting part, huh? It occurred to me the last two years, because I gave a, a lot of lectures, and, uh, but I came to the conclusions, right? That universities in the United States, they, um, I would say, but, uh, about seventy percent of their budget comes from private industry, right, Gab? Right. In here in Canada, it's a hundred percent under the jurisdiction of the provinces, and management doesn't want to bite the hand which beats them, right? Because I'm I'm doing now a lecture series, right? Uh, because. Universities will be the ideal place, or let me put it this way, what is the mandate of a university? I think the mandate of a university is to teach young people how can we have a more civilized society, okay? And so um, I got to know the minister of, of universities, it's a lady, and uh, I said, look, I, 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 I want to teach, or I want to lecture on, or provoke the minds. What would be the structure of an ideal society? Okay, because I, I think it's not done, right? It's why would we talk about it? What is the structure? If we have got no idea what is the structure of an ideal society, how can we ever achieve that? Huh? Mm -hmm. Okay, I know what minimum standards should be in a civilized society. And in a civilized society, no citizen should go hungry. That means there's a soup kitchen or something where anybody could get a meal if they haven't got the money if they're hungry. Mm -hmm. And everybody should have a chance to have, to have, uh, to live where there's a roof, right? Well, with the head, right? So those are, and, and you get access to medical care, right? But that could be done very easily, right? We have the army. The army is, is trained. If there are major disasters, they come in with big tents and pants mm -hmm. and soup. You know, let the army have soup kitchens, right? You know, for every 100,000, maybe you need a soup. Toronto is got to him, would need about maybe 30, right? In different, because if people are hungry, elderly, whatever, they can't walk for miles and miles and miles. So it's going to be, right, that could be easily done. But going back, why I think it's, it's, it's important to have an economic charter of rights. You ever heard of the golden rule? Yes. Yes, like? Treat others is the way you want to be treated? That's not the golden rule. Isn't that the golden rule? No, What's your golden no, no, rule? No. There's only one. Okay. 
The world has always been dominated by the golden rule. Where's the gold makes the rule? Okay. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 that's like that very, very serious. Yes. I don't want to be dominated by anyone if I feel that strong. I should not be able to dominate somebody either, right? Hmm. The question is, how can we dismantle the chains of dominations? Not via violent revolution, via revolution of the mind. Okay? Man is, man is actually more than a person. It's a culture. We call it the fair enterprise system. I'm, a, I'm, I'm for free enterprise. Like, you know, I, I spent a lot of time in Washington, you know. At one time I had a meeting with the leader of the house, with Mitch McConnell. And he said, Mitch, America did great via the free enterprise system. We must do everything we can to preserve free enterprise. Without free enterprise, there's no free society. But he said, free enterprise got a major problem. He said, what you mean? Well, more and more capital is held by few and fewer. In nature, when a species does not reproduce itself, another species will take over. The socialistic, communistic species, okay? That philosophy doesn't work. It's based on wealth distribution. First, you gotta create the wealth. Otherwise, there's nothing to distribute. Yes. So, in essence, the golden rule, the capitalistic system needs modifications. Let it be in a, in a smaller, let it be pure free enterprise. Let them, when it gets larger, no, you need, you need, you need a system where the gold is, 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 is distributed somewhat, right? At the same time, I do say, a society which stifles its citizens in pursuit of productivity, in pursuit of ingenuity or creativity, is a decaying society. But this is where the small companies come in. We must give them all the chances. That's the way to prove that's the way, right? But with Magna had a chance to prove it if you share. You make so much money. We could pay back to death, huh? We could, nobody would go hungry. We could eliminate poverty. We hear from some people in government this idea that we need to replace shareholder capitalism with stakeholder capitalism. This idea that businesses are, you know, accountable to communities and to the environment and to all of these things and not just to their shareholders. It doesn't sound like you embrace that totally, but it does sound like you believe there is a moral duty that businesses have. Well, there is, uh, yeah, I mean, business has a moral duty, right? But there is, look, free enterprise or the capitalistic is, it's only when it gets large. It's, you know, the entrepreneurs are not there anymore. The, you know, the, call it the, the creators are not there. And, and it, it's mainly run by institutions and... Uh, and they, it's different, right? It's not, it's not a partnership anymore. One of the things that I find interesting, you, despite being known for your role of shepherding Magna through the many, many years, you've also become a small business owner. You talked about the farmer's market. We're also sitting here in a, a, an organic food store that you own in uh, Aurora. Why have you gone full circle back to small business? Well, I... I I've been blessed huh, with good health and a very good mind. But when you get older, sometimes you sit back and you um, think about it. What's life all about? Huh? I said to myself, Frank, you've been so blessed with a good mind. Can you be of greatest service to society by looking, by doing different things? And I don't want to be a hypocrite, right, when we are younger. We all hustle a bit to make some money that we can live in dignity, huh? For instance, at Magna, I created about, we had about 420 factories when I kind of slept out in 34 different countries. I could live in any one of those countries with dignity. I wanted to live here because Canada is a great country. 
I think it's the last country left where we could create a role model for the world. It's the last country left where we could, I, I really believe very strongly that we can adopt an economic charter of rights. The human charter of rights has to be fortified with an economic charter of rights. Economic charters of rights will lead to economic democracies, and economic democracies are uh, the democracy by itself. Without that, you cannot have democracy. To a kid in inner city Detroit, democracy, the human, the human child of rights, so it doesn't mean anything. You're free to be hungry. Okay? We gotta, you know, we gotta have a thing that we have a society to eliminate poverty. If workers make more money, it's that drives the business, that drives the thing. So, and it's not, they, they have them all right. So basically, yes, I'm saying the existing business, let it be, but let the new people come up, let them small, let them do things, let them create thousands of that thing, yeah. Well, we've talked about the responsibilities you believe should be conferred to businesses, but you would also, under your ideal charter, have a lot of responsibilities on government. One of them is eliminating red tape. Another one was balancing budgets, uh, which I thought was so incredibly important, and also paying down debt. Uh, because we're, we're told by governments that debt is inevitable, but you're saying you need to start balancing your books. It's, I, so I basically, I basically, again, I, you, uh, you interface with people, you bounce things off. How do you feel about this? How do you feel about that, right? I, um, I think this is a great, great country, but most of all, I think it's maybe the only country left, right? Because I'm worried on the United States, huh? The poverty in inner cities is enormous, okay? I hope I, I know some black leaders, etc. and I always say to them, you gotta be careful that you don't be suckered in on a violent revolution. You know, I'm worried on that, okay? So that kind of leaves Canada. Europe's gone totally socialistic, huh? And when I, I'm not looking down on that. I come from a working class family. I've seen the highest of the high. I've seen the lowest of the low. When I arrived in Canada, you know, I had $200. That didn't last me that long. There were times when I was hungry. Hungry not because I wanted to lose weight. I was hungry, I had no money to buy food. That leaves an impression in your soul, right? Which is, right? So thereby I'm saying I've been blessed beyond, you know. Uh, it's, so, um, so I decided my gut feeling was to do large cars. It doesn't, I, I came closely to the thing here, yeah, I'm doing something which doesn't really benefit society, right? Society from time to time, we cannot ignore the evolutionary, the evolutionary process. At times we have to adjust, okay? You mean when there was only, you know, I think there's about two billion cars on the road, you know, maybe 20 years ago there was maybe a billion, right? I mean, it did not matter, that seemed to, right? But now it matters, huh? Because it's a non-renewable resource. So I decided I, I kind of was kind of worried, uh, or I could see that pretty well all cats had allergies. When I was a kid, allergy, we didn't know allergies, right? I was like a street dog. I could every, <laughs> he did everything. And stage two diabetics, right? So I decided maybe I should go in the destroy. I started to really get involved in the agriculture. I think deep down, basically, I was, was a bit of a farmer, right? Okay. And the more I got into it, the more I could see this chemical jungle, <laughs> you know? When we realize that about 95% of the food eaten is, comes from industrial farms. On the industrial farms, you see no more eagles fly. Why? There's no more rabbits. There's no more pheasants. 
we poison everything. The fungicide, the pesticide we spray kills everything. Basically, we poison the kids, huh? Okay. So one of my things would be, I want to see an economic chart of rights. It also, where we have rights, there's also responsibilities, right? The economic chart of rights, for instance, governments can't have that, huh? Yeah. Okay. But going back quickly on the on the on the on the agriculture, right? My my main that my main aim would be no Canadian kid should go to school hungry. That means breakfast gotta be served. No Canadian kid should leave the school hungry. That means lunch has gotta be served. And by law it would say that would have to be organic. But that's a major problem, huh? Right? Years ago, family farms were the backbone of a country, of Canada, or well, all other countries. A country which could feed itself never had a problem. Family farms are practically on welfare. Mm -hmm. Kids of family farmers say, Mom, Dad, I don't want to be a farmer. I don't want to be on welfare. It's a major, major neglect. Huh? We need, Canada needs a, a family farm trust. Okay, so it's um, so we so the one thing is so I, I kept thinking, can I create something which has nothing to do with politics? Okay, mm. and uh, can I create? And it does not solve. You cannot solve things by pointing fingers. Whose fault it is? Huh? Okay. Um, so when you take a look that our, just the interest payments, right? Mm. They were $150 million a day. Who's getting those and money? And that's money spent on nothing. It goes don't to the banks. Don't, 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 don't. Right for right. We don't know quite the way it goes to, right? Yes. But it's, but years ago, makes the rule. Yes. Okay, we don't, okay? Years ago, you could see the king had, or the king had a castle up on the hill when he taxed the farmers too much, he had revolutions. You don't see the kings anymore. They might be in Hawaii, might be in Beverly Hills, <laughs> might be in Monaco, might be, okay. So we have to, but again, we have, we need a revolution of the mind, and not a destructive revolution. And I do not blame because you go to an evolutionary process, those were the rules at the time, and part of um, that civilization be, be, be improved, that's an evolutionary process, right? Uh, so I was thinking of uh, what can I be of service to the country? Can I, create, can I create something where conservatives will buy in, liberals, NDP, Greens? And so I've done a seven-point program, right? I give you, I get you a copy then, right? Uh, I yeah, we have copies, but let me just quickly what the thing is. Um, you don't solve any things by pointing fingers. You don't solve any things by coming in with a chainsaw. So basically, I'm saying it's crucial. It's very important that we eliminate our debt. Let's have a twenty-year program. You know, with a small percentage to start out with and slowly, nobody could say a 20-year program is a change our program, right? And let's reduce that, right? Then, secondly, we got to reduce the bureaucracy. And again, I'm not blaming the democracy. I'm blaming the system. In a civilized society, every citizen should have the right to find a job, whatever the openings are, okay? But we can't, but how can we, how could be civil, how can we handle that in a civilized way? Nobody would be laid off of the bureaucrat, but it'd be a hiring freeze when they retire. You do not, huh, till you reach, okay? And even if you reach 50%, it's still a 100 to 200% more than we had 40, 50 years ago. But that would be enormously helpful, right? To reduce the bureaucracy. Thirdly, we got to have a black and white tax system. You see the big book over there? Yep. It's the tax code, right? I look occasionally. 
if it's not so serious, you could really laugh, right? Because ooh, there's thousands of paragraphs in there. They, one is more convoluted than the other. It's so convoluted. Mm -hmm. it, it serves special interest groups. Okay? So that needed a black and white. Basically, you have an income tax. Let's say 100,000 is tax free. And then every two or 3,000, it climbs 1% right up to a million, a million would be 50%. But now you could say middle class is about 200,000. There would not be much tax, but when it get up, huh, it pays more. And there's so many loopholes where the very thing here, right? Where they have to pay more taxes, right? Yes. That's what Roosevelt did, huh? The Roosevelt, the, the, the president of, of the United States said, look, we want to get things going. Somebody's got to pay for it. I want you to, I'm going to pay if, you, if, if, if I don't pay for it, it will lead to socialism and communist and, and communistic philosophies. Okay? So that is, um, I think it's very important to understand, right? So point one eliminated that. Point two reduced, the, it should be a percentage of the GDP, right? Okay? Then a simplified tax system. And then uh, the fourth point is to have small business, pure free enterprise. Mm -hmm. Capitalist to really, uh, okay, where well, we create things. In five years, when you reach, you go to, when the small business reaches that, it's, it's a cultural uh, evolution, right? Then you can decide you want to be lot and you got to share. Okay, if you, okay. So that is the fifth point. The sixth point is high school should enter grade 10, grade 11, grade 12. We got to teach our kids some trade. Do we have two years, let's say half a year for each four trades? Let the, that would be. Uh, that'd be a great service. It'd be great for, for everyone. For everyone. Yeah, it does, you still can go to university, right, after grade 12 or whatever. Let it be. But I, I think I think you teach people, you teach young kids uh, where to have an affinity. What would they like to do, right? Okay. That would be. And the seven point is what I mentioned before. No kid should go to school hungry, to school hungry. breakfast got to be served. No Canadian kid should leave the school hungry, they miss lunches got to be served. And below that would have to be organic. That's the simple, it's a simple program. Nobody could say that it's got anything to do with politics. And, uh, and I hope I can persuade uh, sort of uh, um, staunch conservatives and liberals and NDPs and the thing, for the love of the country, let's, let's endorse that program. Just in, in, in closing, Frank, let's say you get your economic charter today. What does Canada look like in 50 years? I would say, I would say in about 10 years, Canada is, would be the first country in the world with an economic charter of rights. Because there's not a simple argument you could make why we shouldn't have one. But what does that do for the country? I'm just saying, for the country, what's we, the vision for we, Canada could, with we, that charter we could in place? Leave, we could eliminate poverty. There'd be no poverty. Let everybody choose their road to happiness. Someone would just fine to... But basically, it would be... Uh, in a civilized country, I, I think you should accumulate when you work for 20 years or 30 years that if you come, that you have, call it a small house or a condo, right? And enough money so that you could live off the interest and do whatever makes you happy. Okay? So, and I, and I demonstrated with the, you with the thing, right? The, uh, you know, I created up to, uh, to 170,000 employees in different countries. It's the same, 
you can create the same condition, it doesn't matter what country it is. Mm -hmm. They understand profits, they understand fairness, okay? I do, I had a number of, of uh, uh, principles or rules I put in a place, right? I had, I created hotlines because when you, especially when you get larger, you, you, you might be missing things. So basically, I, I had hotlines where employees don't have to give a name and they call a number and say, look, this is the, there's discrimination, there's corruption, there's guys uh, touch the bums of women, or whatever, right? We have hotlines, huh? So we, when I introduced the hotlines, the manager were unhappy. They said, are you spying on us? And now they say, gee, that's a great help because we don't. Now we can, we can flush things out, huh? And the second thing, I created a system where we audited the human capital. And that is, you know, I also tried to leave the company not to, not to go with 200 people. So people don't become a number. Yes. Okay. So I had I had an audit committee, right? We had a bunch of day. When you have four hundred, we had maybe ten special teams. They would go. Well, let's say the factory's got two hundred employees. They came in with two hundred envelopes, and there was a questionnaire with ten thing, and you had to cross it off, <laughs> right? Discrimination, unfairness, this or that. No, they collected 200, no names, but we got the temperature of the factory, okay? So it, it's, it's a culture change, it's a thing here. You gotta, um, employees would know if it's a fake thing or a thing, it's got to be the, the real thing. And the real thing will make everybody more monies. Everybody, you know, we could eliminate poverty in Canada because, you know, we enter perhaps the most dangerous times in history because who's dominating the world, right? Up to now, the United States did, huh? They did a reasonable job. They had reasonable democracies. They had, uh, but... Um, more and more gold is held by few and fewer, huh? The United States, there's a very good statistic, about 2% hold about 60% of the assets, huh? That's a, the capitalistic system cannot, will not, you know? And we gotta, for small business, it's pure capitalistic, pure free enterprise, pure freedom, okay? So anyway, I have that program. I give you a copy then that you can question me. And, and I, I do hope that I make progress with universities where they will discuss, you know, what is this, what, is this, what structure should, should we have to have an ideal society? Because they have auditoriums, they can invite uh, a lot of successful people. Our society cannot ignore the arts, uh, you know, the sports, you know but we got to create a value system. Absolutely. We got to come back to uh, what, what are our values, huh? Frank Stronic, thank you very much. Okay, great. Thanks for listening to The Andrew Lawton Show. Support the program by donating to True North at www.tnc.news.